Hello, I'm Mokhar Rizvi, and this is Scope. Now, whenever Iranian elections come around, especially presidential elections more specifically, um, there's always controversy surrounding them, at least on the part of the international community and their understanding of Iran's governing system, as well as the fact that the Constitutional Council has a significant, uh, I wouldn't say control, but a, an approval process in place that vets candidates before they are allowed to then stand as presidential candidates. And this time around is no different. We know and we've all been waiting with bated breath for these elections that are to take place in Iran fairly soon, uh, especially in the context of the JCPOA and other such um, important aspects. Nevertheless, um, a number of high profile potential candidates have not been approved by the Constitutional Council. And then there's then been talk of the fact that whether or not um, this is all essentially a plan of some sort behind the scenes by the establishment to ensure that certain candidate or one certain candidate who I will then put to our guests who are joining us today, um, whether or not he is essentially guaranteed a win in, in some ways. And if this is really against a democratic process altogether, Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the supreme leader of Iran, has come out uh, against all such criticisms, has supported the Constitutional Council, and has then said that people should still come out and vote, and has rubbished all talk of boycotting these elections. Let's discuss this, nevertheless, a bit further. We're now joined by Hamid Reza Khulam Zadeh, who is a PhD candidate in American studies. He's joining us today from Tehran. Also joining us from the Iranian capital is Dr. Fuad Izadi, who is an associate professor of American studies at the University of Tehran. Dr. Izadi and Hamid Reza, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Izadi, I'd like to start with you. Um, as I said, uh, the Iranian uh, vetting process is, yes, unique, uh, fairly unique, I, I should say. Um, just for the sake of our understanding and for our viewers' understanding, why do we need this vetting process in place? And do you think this time around, as even President Rouhani has said, that possibly something may have gone wrong? Well, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I uh, don't think uh, anything has gone wrong. This is the way the system has been set up. Uh, there is this uh, council uh, that uh, vets candidates. This is uh, not something new, uh, unique to Iran. You have uh, basically every country that's, uh, that's a democracy uh, has a process of uh, identifying uh, candidates uh, for that country to be uh, the next president. Uh, and Iran's uh, process is uh, somewhat uh, overt, generally in uh, countries uh, within the political system, uh, candidates are vetted. Some people are disqualified, some people uh, go further, and then uh, before they get uh, to the end, uh, they get to get disqualified. In Iran, uh, anybody basically can go and uh, uh, register, uh, fill out a form to be uh, Iran's next president. Uh, you know, we had the registration process a couple of weeks ago, and you had uh, all types of people uh, educated, uneducated, uh, people with criminal histories, if anybody can go and uh, sign up. Uh, and then the country has set up this uh, vetting process uh, that uh, looks at uh, people that have uh, signed up. Uh, obviously, uh, some people get uh, disqualified uh, because uh, they don't have uh, any uh, experience in the uh, to, to be the country's next president, uh, they're basically easy to disqualify because of, of lack of education or lack of experience or criminal history. Mm. And then uh, you get to uh, certain individuals that uh, may have the potential to become the president. Uh, for example, this year we had uh, a former speaker of the parliament, that uh, Mr. Larijani, yeah. that uh, signed up. Uh, and uh, this, is, this becomes more difficult. Uh, uh, vetting these candidates becomes more difficult. Uh, the law, the election law, requires uh, the candidates uh, to have uh, seven votes within that uh, the council of right. 12 people. Uh, and then if they get seven votes, they go on the list. If they don't get seven votes, they don't. And that's that's how it works, and how these people vote. Yeah. They basically look at people's record and and, and the experience, and, and that's how they make their decisions. 
I mean, there's a, you know, as I said, this happens in every election. I mean, regardless of if the, the incumbent is, is, you know, a, a principalist and or reformist, there's always this, this controversy about this, this process of vetting people. But this time around, we've had now President Rouhani as well um, say that he disagrees with, with, with the way that this occurred and those who have been disqualified. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, every election, there are people who are not satisfied with the situation, and there are people who are satisfied with that. Uh, it, it is not based, uh, based for uh, analysis that who is against that or not. Uh, some some uh, some rounds ago, it was in uh, maybe some some 16 years ago, if I'm not wrong, uh, we had some reformist candidates uh, disapproved by the Guardian Council, where uh, the, uh, the Speaker of the Parliament at that time, which was Mr. Haddad Oden, who is a principalist, he wrote a letter to uh, the leader and asked leader to, uh, um, to to change the situation in order to have them approved to have more diversity in the election at that time, it happened. You know, it, it doesn't mean that it is against one party or one approach and uh, in favor of the other one. Uh, the, the point is that uh, the, the problem, actually, we can say that uh, we didn't have a, a transfer of power from one generation to another generation. So both, uh, both uh, fronts, either principalists and uh, reformists, have the same old people and old faces. Uh, on the basket, and they, they can only provide the same people uh, to register and run for the presidency or for other elections as well. And uh, those people are uh, have the old uh, the performances, and there is everything clear about them. And some of them are naturally disapproved by the uh, guardian council, and it's uh, something that uh, you, can, you cannot uh, deny. Particularly this term, this time. Uh, the Guardian Council announced the criteria beforehand, before the uh, registrations began, and the people tried uh, before candidates signing up for the uh, the, the competition. Uh, the Guardian Council announced the criteria that it has: the, the age, uh, I don't know, performance, background, uh, education, such things, or everything that was considered uh, be, uh, besides other things, like, for example, uh, criminal records and such things. Yeah. But the point is that, as I said, uh, the, the main problem is that the, the, the two fronts are not uh, providing uh, new faces mm. and uh, new opportunities for the people to elect. And the same old faces are actually having the same old problems, and it leads to uh, many people being vetted, being disapproved uh, by the uh, vetting system of the Guardian Council. Dr. Isadi, uh, should there be concern about what um, turnout will be like at the polls? Um, Hamid Razadar made a good point, A, about older faces, and secondly, as you well know, Dr. Isadi, uh, uh, on the part of many people, especially those outside the country and even some inside the country, um, this is being seen as an effort to ensure in some ways that the, the current chief uh, justice of Iran, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Raisi, that he comes out on top. Um, is there any legitimacy to that argument? argument as well. You know, uh, the people who criticize uh, Iran's uh, system of uh, presidential election laws uh, generally belong to two categories. One category, they don't like the type of the government that we have in Iran to start with. They belong to uh, opposition uh, parties that uh, have uh, worked very hard to overthrow the government in the last 40 years. Uh, we sometimes get criticism from the U.S. government, from uh, some European governments. So this is one category of the people who don't like anything about the Islamic Republic. And then we have a second category of people that might have also served uh, as uh, government officials in the past or they're currently serving. And they, uh, well, sometimes they criticize. Uh, different aspects of the political uh, system and election laws. Uh, but one thing we have to remember is that these people got to their position and the place of power through the same, same system. So it would be uh, somewhat concerning uh, when you don't criticize the system, when your candidate wins or when you win, uh, and then criticize the system when you feel that uh, your candidate may not may not win. So there's 
little double standard there that, that you have to worry about. Uh, who is going to be Iran's next president? I don't know. In fact, I don't know who I'm going to vote for, to be honest with you. We have seven uh, candidates. All of them have uh, extensive experience. Uh, and uh, there are a number of choices. We have a former uh, vice president who was in uh, President Khatami's. Uh, uh, he, he was President Khatami's vice president when he was in office. Uh, we have uh, someone who is an appointee of uh, President Rouhani, who is the head of uh, Iran's um, central bank. Uh, and then, as you said, we have the current. Uh, Chief Justice uh, and others, you have seven candidates. Yeah. Uh, and it's not very easy to choose. Hmm. And one thing we like, I like personally about the current system, is that even people like me that uh, teach politics and are university professors don't know about the details of uh, all candidates' backgrounds. Some uh, uh, files that they may have opened in, uh, the, uh, in, in the court uh, system, uh, some misjudgments that they have had when they when they held office. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's actually a good thing for uh, 12 judges. The people who are in that council are all judges. Right. 12 judges to look at people's records and identify people who can be good presidents. Uh, and through this system, we yeah. have had people like President Khatami, we have had people like President Rouhani uh, and uh, others. It's Dr. Izzati, I'm going to interrupt you. I do just just for the sake of time. I do sincerely apologize. I just wanted to, if you allow me, give a final word to, to Hamid Reza before letting both of you go. Hamid Reza, uh, the the word that is being used on the part of many, um, especially outside the country, and I, I think even possibly some within the country, is selection instead of election. Um, is that a, a fair criticism? You know, uh, when President Khatami was elected. Uh, at that time, everyone expected uh, that uh, Nasser Nouri, Mr. Nasser Nouri, would be actually the pick, the selection for the country and for the system. Or uh, uh, three, two rounds ago, eight years ago, no one believed that President Mr. Rouhani is a winner, is going to be the winner. Uh, and even uh, before that, when Mr. Ahmadinejad was elected, at that time, everyone expected uh, Mr. Hashemi Rastanjani, which was a a veteran politician and a high-ranking politician from the beginning of the revolution to be the winner. So uh, Iran, we, there is one certain thing about politics and elections in Iran is that and it is that it always is surprising. So it is no surprise, of course, if uh, you see other uh, other results uh, in, in a month from now. Uh, so you, you cannot say for sure that this is a selection or even the winner of the election is. Uh, going to be Mr. Raisi. You, you, we cannot say that for sure right now. So j just like uh, 24 years ago, like 16 years ago, and like eight years ago, it, it, there are all possibilities that any other uh, uh, runners, uh, other six runners, would be a uh, winning person at the end of the election. Very well. We'll leave it there. I really appreciate both Hamid Reza and Dr. Izzadi for taking their time out of their busy schedules to share their insight with us about, and this time we're talking about their domestic Iranian politics. Of course, this does have reverberations on foreign policy, no doubt. Nevertheless, um, there's a lot of criticism of the uh, Iranian vetting process, as as I put to our panelists who are joining us. Uh, why is there a selection process in place? I mean, it's not unique if you do, as Dr. Izzadi uh, said, study the system of many countries around the world where these things happen in a much more implicit fashion um, and in Iran it's done in a very overt fashion where there is a council and these things are announced from from the get-go and very publicly in some ways about what exactly the credentials must be for somebody to be approved and or disproved so um, this has always been the controversy when it comes to Iranian presidential elections is it a perfect process does it need improvement uh, all of the above of course are very important conversations for Iranians to be having as Hamid Reza there said too maybe it is time for new blood and maybe that is what is missing um, from the Iranian domestic political spectrum at this time. I'll be back with my next segment after this break.
Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Okar Rizvi. Now, we're going to continue discussing, as we have in previous shows, um, what occurred just recently across the occupied territories and um, the continuing international fallout from that. Um, now, the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council has ordered a probe of crimes that were committed during this, this latest war, specifically on Gaza. Um, as one would expect, the Israelis have said that they will not be cooperating in any such investigation. The Americans have also said that this would be an unhelpful step. So so to speak. Um, however, uh, quite a few states, of course, voted in favor of this. Now, another thing that's important to point out here is also the way that Ireland, um, as a Western country, has, has condemned Israel's quote-unquote de facto annexation of Palestine. Um, that's being seen as a significant step. Of course, Ireland has been in the past as well fairly strong in its stances towards uh, Palestine and Palestinian human rights in the face of the occupation. Um, the Irish Parliament has also then passed a motion um, supporting, as I said, and condemning, uh, as I in fact correctly is the correct word, Israel's de facto annexation of Palestinian territories and lands. Uh, let's discuss both of those issues a bit further. And I'm joined by Dr. Vincent Dirac, who is an associate professor at the School of Politics and International Relations at University College Dublin. He's also a visiting professor at Bethlehem University. He's joining us today from Dublin. Joining us today from Belfast is Dr. Brendan Kieran Brown, who is an assistant professor at the School of Religion and Economics at Trinity College Dublin. Brendan and Vincent, thank you both for taking your time at this Saturday to join us. Um, Vincent, let me start with you. Uh, let's, let's flip this a bit and let's start from Ireland first. Um, and I've spoken to, to other Irish experts about this in the past, but I, I wonder uh, where Ireland gets this, this strong stance um, when it comes to the issue of Palestinian human rights, uh, what happens in the occupied territories, etc. Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think for a lot of uh, observers, um, for a lot of Irish people as well, uh, it comes from the Irish experience as you know a European country that uh, more or less uniquely has an experience of colonialism itself, of colonial rule, and the struggle for for self determination. Um, and I think it's you know it's interesting that in the distant past, if you like, there was a great deal of identification with the Zionist struggle uh, in Palestine, precisely because that was seen in similar terms. Um, you know, if you went back to the pre-World War II era, you'd find that there was a lot of Irish sympathy there. Um, perhaps paradoxically, as it might seem, uh, there's a consistency then with Irish sympathy uh, for uh, for. The Palestinian cause, and it's something that has been uh, consistently expressed by uh, Irish uh, politicians uh, and uh, foreign ministers over the course of going on 70 years, um, going back to the, the mid 1950s when uh, the very first statement by an Irish uh, politician at the UN a year after Ireland joined um, addressed the, uh, the Arab Israeli conflict. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, with many people obviously appreciate certainly, I mean, on the on the Palestinian side certainly, the stance that, that Ireland takes. But I, I would think that it's fairly unique, is it not, in the Western world? Well, thanks, thanks again for having me on. And I think Vincent sets the scene very well there. Um, yeah, our Irish uh, connections to Palestine are, are, are long-standing, and also um, let's not forget back um, when. There was a uh, an Irish Republican um, paramilitary organisation um, agitating for uh, an end of British colonial rule on the island. They would have had good connections with the PLO and actually would have met um, members of the PLO uh, in the 60s and 70s um, when those when those uh, movements were were looking for connections. But I think we need to also um, not be too misty eyed about this as well and. Um, you know, there's, there, there's, depending where you are on the island, there's also support for um, for the Israeli state. If you come north, in, in Northern Ireland, for example, um, support for Palestine and support for Israel maps on to um, communal differences between Protestant Unionist loyalists and uh, Irish Republican nationalists and Catholics in the north. So 
So it's not just as straightforward as Ireland supports um, supports Palestine, you know? Yeah, and that, that makes sense. Uh, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Brendan. Um, Vincent, uh, let's talk for a moment, if we can, about the UN Human Rights Council and, and this, this call for a proper probe into what just recently occurred in the occupied territories and more specifically Gaza. Um, the Israelis have said that they will not be taking part in this investigation. That's pretty much been their standard stance in the past. But um, do you think that this will get anywhere where other probes have not in the past? Honestly, difficult to believe that it will, to be to be frank about it. And, uh, you know, one of the most disheartening uh, aspects of, of the most recent expression, if you like, of the, the conflict, and conflict isn't even the appropriate term because the asymmetry between the, the two sides uh, in Israel and Palestine is so vast and conflict suggests mutually opposing forces. And that's simply not the case when you're talking about the, the resources that Israel can can bring to bear. Um, but nonetheless, it's very difficult not to, to feel a sense of deja vu about this. It's very difficult not to think, not to wonder what might be different as compared to, you know, for instance, the 2006 incursion, the much longer uh, engagement in Gaza on the part of the IDF. Um, and I think, uh, you know, investigating the specifics, of course, it's important and uh, it, it may place greater pressure. I think there is increasing pressure. There is sign, There are signs of that uh, on Israel internationally. But absent uh, real shifts in the underlying dynamics which maintain this status quo, and by that I mean the absence of any real pressure uh, on Israel to come to the negotiating table, it's difficult to see what uh, in the longer term, what the, you know, investigating the specifics of this outbreak of violence um, will, will gain uh, will achieve, apart from, of course, uh, doing just that, you know, laying bare quite what happened. Brendan, um, Israel always says that it's, it's you know, the only democracy in the Middle East region, that it's it's a completely free and fair society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when it continues to say that um, the main international organization that is meant to ensure um, international human rights are respected, international laws are respected, human rights laws are respected, et cetera, and continues, continues to say that it will not cooperate with it, or even the ICC, or even any other investigation, that that sort of then uh, says to the rest of us that it sees itself as above international human rights law. I mean, that sort of works against Israel, in fact, doesn't it? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this idea of being the only democracy in the Middle East, now that the cameras aren't, um, you know, turned on the situation in Gaza at, at present, you know, now that the cameras are, are not rolling as much, you're getting reports from inside uh, inside Palestine and Jerusalem and across uh other towns and cities in Israel of mass incarceration, you know, over 1,700 Palestinians being arrested based on uh, protests that were taking place to, to protest the violence. So, so that doesn't sound to me very much like a democracy. Um, and, and I have that, I have that uh, on good authority from colleagues and friends on the ground. But also, like, let's, let's be clear as well, Human Rights Watch, one of the uh, leading international NGOs, came out very very strongly not so long ago and referred to the situation as uh, as apartheid of course building on the work of plenty of palestinian and international scholars who've been saying this for the last 20 25 years if not more so i mean this this idea of being the only democracy in the middle east i think we can we can set that aside and when it comes to the icc and and whatever purported emancipatory potential might exist and um, by sort of um resorting to that form of uh, international legal accountability palestinian scholars and palestinian activists are very aware that that is just one angle that is just one tool that may be available in in a whole broader um arsenal of tools available to to hold israel to account so people don't look at uh, the international criminal court as some kind of panacea to sort this um, situation out. They see it as one tool of many options. Hmm. Well, let's talk about options then, Vincent, because, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, certainly. It, it seems like it's a fairly depressing situation for the Palestinians who would want justice for themselves and a just 
solution, whatever that may be, of course, for them to decide. Um, but, you know, because when we have this argument of anti-Semitism that is thrown around a lot, and, you know, this has happened via social media, especially recently, even in the face of New York Times putting those, you know, the children's faces on um, within its newspaper and many people just calling that in and of itself anti-Semitic libel. I mean, that's I've seen that thrown around as well. It makes it very hard then, doesn't it to then be able to convince somebody that okay listen we need to actually really do an objective uh, investigation into what's occurred on the ground yeah of course I mean this is a hugely important point and uh, you know for as long as uh, you know, the official Israeli narrative is that any criticism of Israel is in and of itself anti-semitic then you close down criticism you close down the sort of focus uh, on what is happening on the ground uh, to which Brendan just referred. Uh, it is, you know, it's extremely reductionistic. It's uh, entirely to be contested. And, you know, uh, very many, of course, uh, Israeli and Jewish critics of uh, Israeli policies, as well, of course, as very many others, entirely reject the simplistic equation of valid criticism of the state of Israel with uh, anti-Semitism uh, ipso facto. It simply isn't the case, and there clearly and absolutely is a distinction between the two. One can be entirely, uh, entirely opposed to anti-Semitism, as I think you know, most rational uh, observers of the, the Middle East are, um, and simultaneously be entirely critical of the ways in which the, the State of Israel uh, conducts itself and uh, seeks then to uh, exempt itself from the, the, the same scrutiny to which other actors uh, in the international arena are, are subject. I wanted to get your thoughts on that as a, as a final word as well, because, uh, you know, when we're talking about options and what can be done then going forward, this is a huge obstacle, is it not? Because. Um, you know, that anti-Semitic label can destroy careers, literally. I mean, we've just had Mark Ruffalo, for example, you know, the Hollywood director now and, and actor, who has had to essentially, in, in many ways, stand down from his original stance when it came to what was occurring in the occupied territories. And there are others, I'm sure, of course, both within the field of journalism, my own field, and within Hollywood and others, who are under extreme pressure um, and literally their careers on the line. How then do we move past this? Well, he didn't have to, he chose to. I guess that's that's the point I would make as well. Um, but I think Vincent has, 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 has laid it out very clearly there. I mean, this is extremely dangerous territory. Um, to, to, to be entering into and, and when you see in in, state, or in places like the UK as well trying to legislate um, for for uh, for definitional clarity around this issue as well we are really we are really um, entering um, as I say dangerous territory but let's be very clear as well in terms of the options you you mentioned there I think it's it's the the, the reason that Ireland was able to make such a strong statement in the Dáil recently was because of the grassroots activism that has that has taken place across the island of Ireland. There, there are many people now are not afraid to speak up, are not afraid to condemn what they see very clearly as war crimes and crimes against humanity. And it is on it is on the international community to stand up collectively and to hold governments to account. Um, and to say very clearly that we do not want you to do business with rogue states. We do not want you to um, to uh, to basically engage in acts that um, that uh, are criminal and and not in our name, essentially. So I, I absolutely appreciate that the, uh, the the charge of anti-Semitism um, is a very challenging one to um, to navigate. But equally, we we must as critical scholars stand up and say very clearly that the state of Israel is acting in a way that is wholly unacceptable. Wonderful. That's a very good point to, to end it on, Brendan. And I really appreciate both Brendan and Vincent for, for taking their time out um, this Saturday to discuss this with us. Um, we discussed two main points there. Uh, the UN Human Rights Council calling for a proper probe into what's occurred um, in Gaza and, of course, by extension, the rest of the Palestinian territories uh, just recently vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli actions as well as, by the way, Palestinian actions. The UN doesn't ever really just target Israel, as, as it so says. It always says that it'll do an objective uh, investigation A. And then B, we discussed um, Ireland's parliament, the Irish parliament passing a de facto 
uh, passing a motion, pardon me, uh, condemning Israel's de facto annexation of Palestinian land. Um, the Irish history of standing up with Palestine is an important one. It's not, of course, across the board, as Brendan there clarified for us, and that's an important distinction and clarification to make as well. And then, of course, then there's this, this label of anti-Semitism, which is attached to every single criticism of Israel. Anyone who dares to point out what Israel has done to Palestinians is immediately labeled, and that does seem like a fairly wide stretch. And secondly, it really actually hurts those who are genuinely against anti-Semitism, as the majority of us are. That's something that Vincent had brought up in his answers as well. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Will Carver. We're now in the final segment of today's show. We're going to discuss Iranian criticism of Israeli influence over the Vienna talks. As we well know, the Americans, or at least Biden, came into office um, saying that he did want to re-enter the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. Donald Trump had walked away from it, just um, under his tenure, of course. Nevertheless, um, the Americans have said that they are in talks as well with the Israelis regarding that, and the Israelis have made it no secret that they do not want the Americans to re-enter the deal. They do not see the deal as a good one, and they have said so from day one, even when Obama had entered the deal at his during his tenure. Um, the Iranians obviously have been critical of the Israeli role in all this, asking why Israel should have this much influence over whether or not the Americans do re-enter the deal. And that's something that I'll put now to our guests who are joining us today. We're joined by Dr. Hans Jacob Schindler, who is a former German security official who served at the German embassy in Tehran from the years 2005 to 2011. He's joining us today from Berlin. Joining us from Cyclone, New Brunswick, is Dr. James Devine, who is an associate professor at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Mount Allison University. James and Hans, thank you both for joining us today. James, I'd like to start with you. Um, apart from criticisms of Iran itself, which, which the Israelis would level, just on the point of Israeli influence over the American decision to re-enter or not um, the JCPOA, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, it's hardly surprising that the Americans are talking to the Israelis about this. Uh, Israel is still an important ally for for the U.S. in the region, and there's no there's there's no way that they want to really sacrifice that alliance just to sign the JCPOA or bring the JCPOA back online. I mean, after all, even with that deal in place. Israel, uh, Iran will not be an American ally. There will t uh, in, continue to be security issues for the United States in the region, and they're going to need, they feel like they're going to need uh, Iran uh, going forward. Moreover, the domestic politics of it in the United States is such that, uh, of course, um, Biden is going to want to try and, uh, in public, make it clear that he's not abandoning the Israelis. So none of this is a surprise. Uh, the question is how well is, is Biden gonna be able to maneuver in this situation? And is he gonna be, he's gonna be pulled in two directions and he's gonna be able to manage it. Hmm. Just to the point of, you know, the, the Israelis have always said that, you know, that Iran has a secret nuclear weapons program uh, uh, wouldn't it make more sense for the Israelis to actually want this deal to survive? Look, I mean, the Israelis have a, always had a very different position on how this problem is supposed to be solved. Um, I don't necessarily would agree with the assertion that just because Israel, Israel um, is negatively inclined towards the JCPOA would prevent any U.S. administration from making a decision. In 2015, if you remember, Israel wasn't exactly uh, very content with the deal either. Um, what uh, the question concerns the uh, nuclear arms program, I mean, not only has there been quite a few hints over the last few decades when the IAA found um, material that was undeclared, uh, um, research that really didn't serve too much of a civilian purpose. And don't forget, end of last year, the Iranian um, intelligence minister in the media openly threatened that if pushed, Iran may build a bomb, which also means there has been some thinking in Tehran around that. Hmm. Uh, James, uh, I want to ask you, in fact, the same question I just put to Hans, because for the Israelis, um, they've always said that they feel threatened by any nuclear weapons program that Iran may or may not have. And of course, as we know, the Iranians have always denied that. And to the best of my knowledge, nothing has yet been found, which is a smoking gun to prove there is a weapons element yet to that program. Um, why not 
take this what this deal and run with it uh, for now? There, there's two reasons. I mean, the, the first is the, the, the most obvious reason is that the Israelis just don't trust the Iranians and they don't trust the nature and structure of the JCPOA to, to constrain Iran's nuclear program. Um, even if there isn't a smoking gun, the Israelis believe that Iran is either going to get a weapon or get very close to having a weapon. The second question is, is really about Iran's position in the Middle East. Um, for the Israelis, they would prefer to see uh, Iran kept uh, constrained, to, kept, to keep Iran isolated, to stop it from allowing to expand its reach in the region. And they see the JCPOA as a way for Iran um, to to actually get more powerful by once uh, by you know removing sanctions, it'll re uh, it'll make it easier for Iran to uh, not only re uh, rebuild its economy but also fund groups like Hezbollah and uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Palestine. So for the Israelis, even if it means conflict and tension, they would rather have Iran. Um, they would rather have Iran uh, weaker and isolated than have Iran getting healthy and having the JCPOA and having better diplomatic relations with the rest of the world. You know, um, you're sitting in Berlin, Hans, so I'm going to ask you and put you on the spot again, as I have in a few shows in the past as well, on the European point of view and the German point of view on this, because the Europeans certainly, of course, want this deal to survive. They've remained in it. They've not walked away from it. Um, but I wonder, just on the, on the, the argument of uh, these individual countries who are part of this deal and their respective national interests versus then the interests of Israel, which may not always align, right, when it comes to, to the above uh, JCPOA deal that we're discussing. At, at what point then should that line be drawn for them to say, hey, listen, this is in our interest to ensure this deal survives? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, speaking from Germany, the German government has always, for very obvious historical reasons, maintained that Israel's uh, security is as much a priority as it, uh, for it than it is for the Israeli government. There's also very few differences as far as the characterization of uh, um, Iran's behavior in the uh, region and the nature of this regime is concerned. So we agree on the basics. Um, we just differ slightly on the way forward. We. Um, if I speak for the Europeans, the Europeans see um, a arms control deal, what the JCPOA is, both um, very as strategically important to can maintain visibility in the program in Iran, and that's why it is so harmful that the Iranians for the last couple of months have started playing around with the IAEA and its access in Iran. Um, but also on a more strategic level, it's an arms control treaty that for the first time puts a line between what is a civilian and what is a military program, and therefore somewhat, not const uh, not completely, but somewhat rectifies the big loophole that the NPT treaty, the uh, uh, treaty, the international treaty that controls nuclear uh, uh, technology and research has, is that a civilian and a military program look exactly the same until you start putting the parts together uh, for a nuclear warhead. And now the, N the JCPOA does make some definition of what a civilian nuclear program for a size of a country the size of Iran looks like. So there are really two issues at stake here. Um, on the one hand, the Iranian issue. On the other hand, um, the broader nuclear non-proliferation issue. Um, that's why already in 2015, and I absolutely admit the Europeans neglected step two, the idea was already what the Biden administration says now, yeah. to build on the JCPOA um, to talk about regional issues with Iran. James, I'll give you the final word before I let both of you go. Uh, what is the alternative here? Now, I've asked Iranian experts this too, and they, they give me a list of alternatives that they may have if this deal completely falls apart, as in if the Americans do not re-enter it. But I wonder then from the other side, what is the alternative? I mean, what do the Israelis want to happen? I mean, I, I'm sure that they would realize that any alternative a would have major negative uh, reactions from the Iranians, and that would just be that much tougher than to sell to the Iranians to be willing to sign on to. Well, I think from the Israeli perspective, they, again, they're, they're not willing to live with Iran having a nuclear weapon or being close to a nuclear weapon. Um, so th they see this as, a, you know, this is a, the type of threat that they're, they're that they they, can't, they just can't abide having uh, in place. Um, they would rather, I think, have low-level conflict go on uh, for a, a longer period of time um, 
and hopefully eventually enough pressure put on the Iranian regime that it collapses. And there's certainly, there, there will be people inside of uh, with more hawkish elements inside of Israel and in the United States who felt that sanctions were actually bringing the regime down and it's just simply a question of continuing them. Uh, so they would rather go that route and risk conflict. And again, right, for, for Israel, the kind of conflict that they're likely to see is something that they've dealt with in the past. It's unpleasant, it's, 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 uh, it creates a lot of problems for the country, but it's something they can survive. Um, and they would rather go that route than risk the possibility of Iran becoming more empowered in the region uh, and more difficult to deal with at a later date. So a right. crisis now, for, from the Israeli perspective, is better than a larger war later on. Whether that's actually an, an accurate assessment of the situation and whether that strategy would actually work uh, is, is a different question altogether. Indeed. And we'll, we really appreciate both James and Hans for taking their time out this Saturday to discuss this with us. We were discussing there um, something that the Iranian foreign ministry spokesman brought up, and that is essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, his words, uh, Israeli influence over the Vienna talks, uh, which aim to, at least on the part of the Biden administration, have the U.S. re-enter the deal, the JCPOA, that is, the Iran nuclear deal, of which the U.S. is one party, or used to be at least a party, before Donald Trump walked away from it. Um, will Israel muddy the waters to an extent where the Americans will not re-enter the deal? And then what does that then mean? What happens then the next day if this all falls apart? Uh, what will the Iranians do? What will the Israelis do? What will the Americans do? And none of these scenarios look very pretty. So one always wonders then, who are we then appeasing? And is this all worth it? Um, is it not better to run with this deal at this time and then uh, deal with other grievances that, that all sides may have later on? I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching. Thank you.